I think it's very interesting mm -hmm. to have the profession of a meditation teacher. Like, who are your students? What does that look like? Do they come meet you at a certain place? Do you do it all in person or virtually? Do you teach celebrities? Do you teach normal people? I'm so curious as to the experience. So I lived in Los Angeles for 16 years. And when you're doing anything at a high level in Los Angeles for that long, you're going to cross paths with some celebrities. And uh, I'll tell you one of the most interesting celebrity experiences I've had, only because she's talked about it publicly. I was invited to dinner with this uh with a friend by a friend of mine because he was friends with this kind of b-list celebrity and i found her very attractive so i was like okay i'll go to dinner with you and your attractive b-list celebrity i'd never seen her before until he mentioned her name and so i kind of looked her up and was like oh okay she's yeah she's cute so we're at dinner and the subject of meditation comes up and this is like in 2014 or something like that Normally, when people bring up meditation at dinner or something like that, I just change the subject because you know, it's not really what I want to be talking about when I'm socializing, honestly. Uh, but she kept coming back to meditation like she was really interested in it. So finally, she goes, wow, well, I'd love to learn that. I was like, all right, cool. You know, not thinking anything about it. Didn't think she was going to follow up with it. And so she follows up and so she comes and I give her a private meditation course. I didn't even think she was going to do it. But she starts doing it. She starts blogging about it. She starts blogging about working with me. So yeah, I go on to like the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. I forget about it. Four years later, I wrote this book called Bliss More, How to Succeed in Meditation Without Really Trying. It was my sort of definitive how to meditate book, teaching people how to do this kind of effortless approach to meditation. And the publisher, Random House, was like, can you give us a list of celebrities that you work with so we can like, you know, use that to promote the book? So I wrote a list of maybe 20 people who I work with, people like Rosario Dawson and Jonah Hill and, you know, all these kind of people. And I didn't even think about her because she wasn't that big of a celebrity. And then in the news at the time, that celebrity had gotten engaged to Prince Harry. And I was like, oh, that's right. I work with Meghan Markle that one time. <laughs> wow. That's a biggie. And so I told the publisher and then, and then they went, you know, bananas. And then they were getting married at the time. And I got all this, all these press leads. Yeah. People wanted me to bring on today's show. And I turned it all down because they didn't really want to talk about my book. They wanted me to get in there and gossip of about, course. about, um, Meghan Markle. So I'm, 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 happy that I didn't do that. My publisher wasn't that happy about it because they were you know, wanting to sell books. But yeah, that was, it was a fun little celebrity run in. But it sounds like she was interested in genuinely learning. Yeah. I mean, they went and dug up her old blog, which she had deactivated. They went on the way back machine and they found my name. And, you know, so there were all these articles that were written about me and being her like guru and all this kind of stuff. That's crazy. I love that. crazy. That makes sense. Is it harder to teach celebrities or are they, are they more receptive or less? I find that when you're working with celebrities, they're just yes all the time. So sometimes it's harder for them to just take direction or do you have any sort of like you know, insights of them being different? There's a uh, anecdote about Sigmund Freud. Apparently he was, he was interviewed by some journalist who asked him do you, if you could choose between working with poor people or rich people, which one would you choose? And he said, rich people. And the journalist was shocked and goes, why? And he said, because with rich people, you don't have to convince them that having more money is going to be the answer to their problem. Because they know it's not. Because they know it's not. So I would say with celebrities, they're actually easier to teach because mm -hmm. they're not thinking that being famous or having money is going to be the answer to their problems. What a great insight. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting insight. And I say it all the time. I grew up as a horseback rider and having been friends with some of the wealthiest people, I find them to be some of the least happy mm -hmm. that I've ever known. It's very interesting. Well, so let's talk about your ability to understand that detachment from <laughs> money, houses, and all material things can bring happiness because you now live a nomadic lifestyle and you live life untethered. Mm -hmm. So let's talk. I mean, I really would love to just hear about that. That's where I want us to kind of move into it. It's like in the home stretch here. Cause I just, I don't know anybody else who does that. I love that. I think in a dream world, mm -hmm. I would do that. 
I, I, there was one time in my life after rehab where I had blown up my life to an extent where like all my yets had come true. Like at the end of my addiction, I was like, well, I'm not unemployed and unemployable yet. yet. I'm not, you know, haven't lost the, my family or friends yet, all the relationships yet. So those all came true, mm -hmm. which was the biggest gift because then I had the gift of desperation mm -hmm. and I was willing to get help. Anything that I had could fit in my head of VW bug at that time, which is very humbling, very humbling. My mom bought it for me because she thought it would be cute. Not knowing that was going to be your future apartment. Yeah, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't agree, but I did appreciate that I had four wheels and a, you know, a motor, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but anything that I could own fit in that car. And I drove it also to Los Angeles and I went and I worked out there for a while. That was the closest I ever got to an untethered lifestyle though. It was really just a reduction in stuff as I went from one apartment to another. Yeah. Tell me what it truly means to live life untethered. So around 2016, I started feeling a calling to, to live nomadically. And I had a two bedroom apartment in Santa Monica. I had two cars. I had a Vespa. I had like artwork, you know, just everything from 40 years of living. I was 45 at the time that I actually did it. It just seemed like a really interesting challenge, kind of like changing my name was. Can I get rid of everything without storage? Get rid of everything that doesn't fit into a carry-on bag. It didn't get real until I turned in my 30-day notice because I was renting an apartment. The clock was on and I just started garage selling and getting rid of stuff. And oddly enough, the hardest thing to get rid of was my plants because I had these really nice plants that had been with me for years and I didn't want just anybody to get them. So I was like interviewing people. And so what are you going to do with these? Where, where are they going to go? Do you, <laughs> do you have pots? That's sweet. <laughs> yeah. But everything else kind of, I was able to get rid of pretty easily, you know, and I'm talking scrapbooks, I'm talking yearbooks, I'm talking journals. What I did was I started to uh, digitize everything. So I got all my old videos. I had VHS stuff and I actually hired a service to, scan everything in. And so I have everything in my phone right now that I used to have in a closet collecting dust somewhere that I would look at, you know, occasion like once every few years. That was really cool. And um, and then I eventually rolled out of my apartment on May 31st, 2018. And not knowing how long I was going to do it for. Fortunately, I was promoting that book I told you about, the how, the how to Meditate book. So I was working with Wanderlust and I had about 18 different dates with Wanderlust. So they were flying me around. So everything just kind of worked out perfectly. And then from there, it just kept going. And I was doing this little circuit, LA, New York, London, occasionally Bali, Australia, uh, Atlanta. And then the pandemic hit. It was like musical chairs. Everybody like went back to their chair and I didn't really have a chair to go back to. So that's how I landed in Mexico City. It's because I'd been going to Mexico City and I fell in love with, with that place. And it was very good for walking and weather. And I was like, okay, I want to be there. So at that point, I had scaled down to just a day pack. I got rid of more than half my stuff because I realized I was asking the wrong question. When I first did it, my question was, what's the biggest carry-on bag I can get that I can check into the overhead compartment of a plane and how much shit can I fit into it? Instead of, what do I actually use on a day-to-day -day basis? And so when I started asking that question, combined with learning how to hand wash my own clothes, which I thought was like a Rubik's cube, but it actually ended up being very much more simpler than that. And actually your clothes can get even cleaner when you hand wash them. I was able to cut down the wardrobe significantly and lighten the load a bit. You know, granted, I don't have kids, I don't have hair. So I'm a guy, so I have, this is my one pair of shoes. So it was a lot simpler, a lot easier to do. And, and it's something that I felt called to do. And so when I wrote about it later in my book, Travel Light, my invitation to the reader is like, I'm not writing about this to inspire you to live out of a backpack. Like that's really extreme and rigid for 99.9% .9 of people, but you have your version of that. And it could be starting your podcast. It could be becoming a speaker. It could be putting yourself out there in some way that you're not doing and your heart's calling you to do it. That's the message I want you to take away from this experiment is what's my version of that? What's my version of asking myself the right questions instead of the wrong questions, such as who's paying attention to what I'm doing and are they gonna be upset by me taking that leap of faith and all these kind of nonsensical questions that disempower you and make you make weaker choices.